All right. Welcome back, everyone. Let me. Yeah, so today I have a treat for you. Uh, Steve Peterson is going to talk about some of the pretty good practices from his 20 years or more of experience in doing system dynamics. Um, so Steve had a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's degree in uh, resource systems and policy design. He's been with Stella for over 15 years as well and you know, ha has a lot of experience in doing system dynamics modeling and instructing. And so without further ado, uh, Steve, the stage is yours. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so we have a small group here and maybe some people will be uh, watching the recording. Um, when I put this title together, I was thinking that it'd be really nice to have us talk about practices for doing good system dynamics work. And, you know, people talk about best practices and I, I don't know quite what that means, but I know that some stuff has worked for me pretty well. As I put the recording or I put the presentation together, it really turned out that uh, I'm, I'm spending a little bit more time of talking about some applications that I've been involved with. And, uh, and we'll talk about practices at the end. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I want to start with just a few objectives for the session, and we'll have a chance for you to give your objectives. Um, I'll provide just a little bit of context, kind of historical. Ruby has done that uh, a bit, and I want to provide just a little bit more. I want to talk about the biomass scenario model, which is a, a really a long-term project that I've been involved with, um, sponsored by the National Renewable Energy Lab in the United States as well as the Department of Energy's uh, Biomass Energy uh, Technology Office. And uh, I'll use that as kind of context for a simplified version of that model where we backcasted ethanol production in the United States. We'll use all of that to distill a couple of what I'll call pretty good practices, and then we should have some time for discussion at the end. So that's where we're headed. So my objectives here, the first thing I want to do is to provide a little bit of a view for you all into uh, a really a long-term project that we engage in. And this project touches on environment and sustainability issues, which is kind of the focus of this group. And uh, so I think it, there, there may be some good relevance there. I want to talk about some practices for doing system dynamics work. And these have been helpful to me both as a practitioner on one hand and as a teacher, and they may have some value for you if you choose to adopt them. Uh, I'm not gonna get upset if you don't, but it's worth uh, talking about. And then we can have a little bit of a space to discuss how we might learn and grow together as a, as a group here. So that's, uh, that's where we're headed. Um, I'm curious about what you want to get out of this session. And, you know, when I put this sort of question to my class, some of them say, well, I just want to get out of this session. And that's a joke and nobody's laughing because everybody's on mute. But um, I'd love for you to just type in what you're what you're thinking, what you want to achieve from this. And then uh, as we're um, you know, as we're talking, we can we can maybe uh, try to tailor things to those those needs. So if you want to take just a minute and type in your thoughts about what you'd like to achieve from this session, that would be fantastic. Okay, hearing about long-term project experience. Um, anyone else? We'll just take another minute here. Uh, hear about methods, okay. All right, we're a small enough group that I can sort of lean on you here. And, and Allison, you, you turn out to be uh, on the video here staring me down, so you got to type something. Okay, so long-term development of the biomass scenario model. Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and move forward then. Um, so I want to provide just a little bit of context first. And so, you know, I'll, I'll start by just providing a couple of points in my career arc, just to give you a sense for kind of uh, where I'm coming from and where I'm headed. And some of you have seen this before, but it's probably worthwhile. So 
Uh, here's me in about 1976. Uh, before becoming a system dynamics modeler. This is actually Napoleon Dynamite uh, from a movie that some of you may have seen around the early 2000s. So I grew up in, a, in the same area that this movie was shot. And I actually, when I was in high school, I had the big tie and the brown corduroy suit that Napoleon had. And if you look in the background, there's an Oldsmobile uh, uh, Delta 88, I think. And I actually had a purple Oldsmobile Delta 88 as well. So I, I was Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, I, I actually was, mine was a hard top cream. So uh, just so you know. So that's me before becoming a modeler. And then, you know, kind of move forward many years in time. And here's a picture of me. And you can see me kind of circled here. And you can see um, then uh, candidate, soon to be President Barack Obama, pointing me out and he's asking me to serve humanity by teaching and doing system dynamics modeling. And so so to, to me, this stuff is kind of a calling, I guess I'd say, in the sense that I really believe that as you're doing this and thinking in this way, the world can be a better place. And so that's maybe a little bit of context of where I'm coming from, maybe, maybe helpful. Okay, so we'll talk about the biomass scenario model a little bit. So this model, um, is focused primarily on the biomass to biofuel supply chain within the United States. So biomass, uh, crops, uh, residues, and so forth, uh, going through conversion processes and producing fuels that then are used for transportation. That's, that's kind of the main focus of the project. Um, it's at the core of what I like to call an analysis platform. And this platform has been used in an awful lot of studies over the years to look at development of the bioenergy supply chain within the U United States. What does it take? What do you have to believe in order for that uh, supply chain to grow and develop over time? What are the implications of doing that? Um, the project is a really a long-term project. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's sponsored by National Renewable Energy Lab. Those are my uh, points of contact for doing the work. Um, and uh, they're, they're sponsored by the Department of Energy within the United States and its Bio uh, Energy Technologies Office, uh, which is called BITO. Um, we received a, an award for this project back in 2018 um, for the appl applications of, of the uh, of um, is actually I'll read it off the best app best real world application of system dynamics uh, for for that year so it's kind of a big deal in a lot of ways and it's gotten a lot of traction over the years just to give you a bit of a sense for things here's a timeline that sort of moves up to about 2018 I pulled this off of um, off of a, a paper we put together for the system dynamics review. So we actually started this almost 20 years ago and it started, um, Kareem, you'll get a kick out of this. I got a call from Lee Lind, uh, who both Kareem and I know um, at Dartmouth. And he said, hey, you know, Steve, how about doing a workshop for some people at NREL who are thinking about doing uh, some transition modeling from where we're at now to uh, a bioenergy future. And uh, that phone call really developed into a prototype model, which was kind of the 2003-2005 timeframe. Then we picked up the work again in 2007, and we, we basically developed the core of the model, which looks at uh, uh, feedstock production in the context of the United States agricultural system, looked at conversion options, primarily at that point, conversion of cellulosic feedstocks to ethanol, which was kind of a big deal at that point um, in, in the United States. Uh, we, we added infrastructure compatible fuels uh, over the 2009-2011 timeframe. And then we've used it for an awful lot of analyses over the years since then, done small enhancements and so forth. So that's kind of where the model is at. And you can see kind of some analysis points in there and also some outreach points along there to kind of give you a sense for what's going on. You're able to read the screen okay, yeah? Is that uh, doing okay? Okay, Allison's feeling okay about this. So we'll go ahead. So that's kind of a sense of where it's at. In terms of what's in the model, we don't have time this year 
to really go into a deep dive into the model, but I wanted to give you a bit of a sense for what it looks like. So um, this is a, a picture of the model architecture. And so you can think about the supply chain or the supply line as existing in basically four or five different stages. So feedstock supply and logistics, conversions of feedstocks, the oil industry, downstream ethanol activities, pretty important stuff, uh, imports, and here we focus primarily on ethanol and exports as well, and then vehicles. So those are kind of the main modules within the, uh, within the model. And what we've tried to do with this is each of these words within these big stages represents a module within the BSM. So for example, if you look at starch ethanol, which is going to be our focus in a few minutes, that's a module that looks at the investment in starch ethanol conversion facilities and the operation of those in order to produce fuel ethanol, which in turn goes downstream into the modules of distribution, dispensing stations, inventory and pricing and so forth. So is that making some sense here? Uh, please uh, feel free to drop notes in the chat if you have questions, and we'll try to answer those as we go along. Does that sound all right? Okay, I'm I'm looking again at you, Allison, because you're the only uh, you're the only uh, photo on here. So keep nodding if or or scowl if things are not going well. So that's a picture of kind of what's in the model at a high level. Um, I wanted to give you kind of a sense for some of the feedbacks within the model. And uh, essentially within the agricultural system, what we're doing is we're allocating land to produce different crops, including cellulosic feedstocks, um, such as switchgrass, miscanthus, and so forth, in order to uh, maximize profits within, uh, within each of the 10 geographic regions of the model. So um, if you look at the loops up at the top, uh, this might give a sense for things. So demand for commodity crops is typically driven by scenarios that we get from the USDA, the Department of Agriculture within the United States. That drives consumption and the supply of different crops relative to the demand for those is driving a price signal. That price signal in turn determines what the grower payment is, how much on a per acre or a per hectare basis um, growers will be getting in terms of their profitability. That relative grower payment determines land allocation across commodity crops and also between commodity crops such as corn, wheat, um, other small grains and soybeans. Those are kind of the big crops that we track as well as cotton within the United States. And we compare that against what's going on with felt cellulosic feedstocks in the overall BSM. Okay, so far so good. I'm going to admit uh, Jenna back into the uh, presentation because she's waiting in the lobby. We'll see if that works for us. So that's a sense for kind of the simple feedback. And uh, so that's that's how we allocate land to produce crops to balance production and consumption of those crops uh, within within BSM, again, across commodity crops, as well as for cellulosic feedstocks such as switchgrass and miscanthus and so forth. Quick question, Steve. So do we take into account um, land use change, say, you know, urbanization that reduces uh, available we, we land? Do. Yeah, and one of the kind of interesting things is you could look at the overall profitability of a unit of land within a region and you could ask, is that overall profitability in terms of producing crops higher than it would be in other uses? And we allow for some simple movements into and out of production based on that. We try to track overall land use within each of our 10 geographic regions within the United States. 
against USDA data. So we try to track that pretty well, and we seem to do a pretty good job of that in terms of calibration of BSM. Great, does that, does that help, you. Ruby? Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay, cool. So in terms of conversion, um, basically what goes on in the conversion modules is we look at the attractiveness of investment in different conversion options. And that investment grows the capacity of those uh, um, conversion options, which in turn increases production. And as production increases, the maturity of the industry increases as well. And that can do things like make it more attractive to invest in the future because uh, capital costs might be lower, yields might be higher, and so forth. So there's a reinforcing or a positive feedback going on that allows uh, uh, conversion to, to build over time. And what you see here is what uh, Dana Meadows like to call the competitive exclusion principle uh, in operation here, um, in the sense that if one conversion option for producing a fuel can gain some traction, then it can crowd out other options in terms of the investment dollars that it brings to it. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic. And you see this crowding out phenomenon in a lot of the overall BSM uh, uh, analyses that we do. So just again, to give you a sense of kind of what the feedback structure of the model is. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and I'm gonna talk about a subset of BSM. And I wanna ask how ethanol within the United States built out over time. Now, uh, uh, I'm going to say, Rakshinda, is, is that close to the right pronunciation for your name? Go ahead and you can respond if you'd like. Um, yes. Okay. So um, I'm not sure how, how outside of the U.S. people are familiar with uh, ethanol use within the United States, but um, it, currently in the United States, any gallon of gasoline that you put into the tank of your vehicle typically has about 10% ethanol within that. It's blended in. And uh, that's grown up over the period 2000 to, to present, basically. And so one of the questions that we wanted to ask with this in doing some work with the EPA um, was, well, what are the causes of, of that ethanol buildout? can we backcast and understand why that built out? So the blue line here is showing ethanol production over that period, and it moved from something pretty small up to something like 15 billion gallons per year, roughly 15 billion gallons per year, which is what's known as the blend wall. If you take all of the gasoline uh, consumed in the United States in a year, and take 10% of that, which is sort of the limit uh, that people are using these days, that's the blend wall. So you kind of run up to the blend wall in about 2009-ish or so, a little bit over, and you can see kind of this flat consumption curve over that period. So the question is, what really caused that build out? So a couple of hypotheses. One is, well, it's really all due to the phase out of MTBE, which is a fancy name for methyl tert-butyl ether, which was a lead replacement uh, when lead was phased out of the gasoline supply of the United States. It enhanced octane ratings in gasoline. Unfortunately, it led to a lot of pollution in groundwater and is bad news. And that was banned over the period 2002 to 2006. It was phased out of production. So, so maybe that's why. A second might be, well, it's all subsidies. And VTEC is sort of the, the catchword for subsidies. That sounds stands for volumetric ethanol excise tax credit. And uh, that was somewhere between 50 to 55 cents in the early years of ethanol production to uh, 45 cents um, over the period 2002 to 2011. So maybe that's the cause. A second would be, uh, the Renewable Fuel Standard, or RINS. And Renewable Fuel Standard is basically a um, mechanism for setting mandates for how much renewable fuel is used in the United States. RINS are called renewable uh, 
what are they called here? Renewable identification numbers. And those are used to enforce that compliance. Essentially, um, there you can think of them as a as a subsidy for um, for uh, alternative fuels such as ethanol. So that might be a thing. And then there's other things that you might think about, just basic market forces. You know, is it the case that you could extend the volume of gasoline if the price of gasoline was less than the price or, or more than the price of ethanol? Is there a substitution effect where um, at the uh, at the pump people are substituting ethanol for gasoline? And the, the final piece, ethanol is a, is a way to enhance octane. And uh, over the period roughly 2005 to 2011 or so, we saw a build out of changing the way that uh, refiners had octane in their gasoline. So instead of higher octane refined at the refinery, they were producing lower octane and then using ethanol to build that up. So that's another hypothesis. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the BSM and we're going to constrict it so that we can understand those dynamics. OK, and it turns out there's an article on this work. This is, I think, how academics do this, right? Uh, Allison, show the little picture of the photo, uh, photo of, the, uh, of the work. So this, uh, this is forthcoming, and you can read the abstract really quickly. But basically, in this uh, paper, folks from NREL, from EPA, and, uh, and I also, and as well as me, we uh, were using uh, the model to do some hypothesis testing, a little bit different than what I'm going to show here, but I think it's kind of an interesting article. So keep your eyes open if you're interested. Okay, so um, in terms of modifying the model, we made three or four basic different uh, changes to the model. The first is that we deactivated a bunch of modules within the model. So instead of having all of these different modules going on, we kind of focused on starch and oil crops, and we kept the feedstock system in place. We simplified everything downstream and basically drove the uh, inventory and pricing with a demand signal for overall gasoline over the period of interest. Okay, so that's the first thing that we did was to simplify the model. The second thing we did was we added some structure to support hypothesis testing. So I gave you a bunch of acronyms earlier, and I'm going to test you, Kareem, on those later on because I know you have a photographic memory. But um, what you can see here is that RINs and VTEC are affecting producer revenue uh, at the point of conversion. Price based substitution is working in terms of affecting demand for ethanol. So it's a demand side piece. And then finally, investment in match blend infrastructure, which is really this octane enhancer concept, is uh, working based on the cost of ethanol relative uh, to the cost of other octane enhancers on an octane point basis. So we did some math there to kind of manage all of that. Then finally, MTB phase out is working on the ethanol demand side. All that making some sense here? Kareem's about to say something. Steve, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so I don't understand the price based substitution. Are there areas in the country where there are flex fuel vehicles? No. So this was this is what's called splash blending, Kareem. And so if you wind back to when uh, I had hair um, in the early 80s, um, uh, actually, yeah, yeah, 2002, I had hair as well. But in, in the time when, when ethanol was just building up, um, what, what folks were doing at the point of distribution, and you could think of oil tanks within your town where people were distributing things, they were basically blending in at the truck that goes to the dispensing station, 10% ethanol, and that was what was going into the dispensing station tank. So it wasn't really a flex fuel thing. It was really at the uh, at the point of distribution that this was going on. Does that help a little? Yes, thanks. OK, so what I want to do here uh, is just note other things we did. We did a little bit more work on the model. We had to calibrate the model to uh, historical data. And we got that from uh, what's called the United States Department of Agricultural Baseline. 
And so this has things like prices, yield, how much land is used and so forth. So it's a great resource of data that we could calibrate to. Uh, we also calibrated to historical oil price data. And then um, what we had to do was to sort of suss out uh, what starch industry conversion techno-economic inputs would look like. So things like the capital cost of putting a starch ethanol conversion facility into the ground back in 2000 versus in 2020. So kind of different things there. What was the process yield for those and so forth? And then finally, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, what's the blend wall constraint for ethanol consumption? What's the maximum? And to do that, we just calculated how much fuel was used in the in the period of 2000 to 2020 and took 10% of that. And that gave us a blend wall. Okay. So we modified the BSM to support testing. And so here's a picture of a simple interface. And we're going to do some magic here if this all works. I'm going to actually shut off uh, sharing here. And then I'm going to turn on sharing. And, and you should be able to see this now. Can you all see that OK? And I have to bring back my, there it is. Can you see the screen OK? Yes. yes. OK, Hello. so what we'll do here is we'll just do a few runs. And uh, to do this, I'm using the Stella software. And uh, I've created just a very, very simple interface so that we can begin to test some hypotheses with this. So I'll hit the Run button. And what we see here is sort of a historical calibration. So in the top left panel, we see ethanol production. The dotted red lines are historical. And what the model's generating is in blue. We get pretty good agreement, although just a little bit of disagreement kind of in the year 2008, 2009-ish here. But we get a pretty good tracking of history of both production and consumption. So one hypothesis that we might want to test is what would happen in a world in which there were no uh, RINs? So what would happen in a world in which there was no um, renewable fuel standard over the period 2006 to present? How would that affect the overall results of things? I'll just click the switch off here. And I'll hit a run again, and we'll see what happens here. And you can see that there's a little bit of a difference relative to what we saw before. So in these out years, you see a little bit of a difference, but not too much. Now, one of the things that Ruby asked is, were there land use considerations here? So we can actually scroll down. I've created this. And you can see what's going on in the model with corn production, soy production, wheat production, trying to track those, as well as land planted in those different um, different cases under this counterfactual. So we'll come back to that in a minute. OK, so we can ask then, what would happen if the oil industry decided, no, 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 we're not going to use ethanol as a way to enhance octane, and we're not going to change the way refineries work and infrastructure work so that we go to this sort of concept of match blending? And so I'll just shut this switch off. I think that shuts it off and we'll hit run. And you can see a very, very different response now once it refreshes. Are we going to refresh? That's odd. So we'll try this. There we go. So refresh this. You can see very different response here now. So we see a big hit here. And this is actually when the VTEC ends that you end up with this big drop. So if you're giving people uh, 50 cents a gallon roughly uh, for fuel and uh, the fuel price is around two bucks a gallon and you suddenly drop that, utilization of facilities is going to drop off pretty dramatically until the market equilibrates. But you can see that this match blending uh, has a big difference in terms of overall ethanol consumption and production relative to what was observed. 
And you can see some interesting implications here for land use. A little bit of interesting implications for land use. We're seeing some exporting here, but we're keeping pretty close with all of this. Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll shift and we'll shut off the VTEC, which is again the volumetric uh, ethanol excise tax, and we'll see how that affects the system. So I'll click this, we'll run. And now you see a little bit different response here in the early years, right? You see a little bit less growth here in this case, a little slower growth. So we can begin to understand, you know, what the role of VTEC was in terms of the overall uh, output here. And I'm seeing some typing going on. Just jump in and ask. That might be easy to do as well, Rashina. Sorry, it was about this back casting, and I don't understand like how uh, you were getting the values. Like you're calling them historical, but they are for the same years. So it may be a silly question, yeah. but I didn't yes. get it. So, so, so back casting is uh, is actually in the paper we talk about it as kind casting, right? Which I didn't like that, so I called it back casting. So you know, if you think about forecasting, you're kind of looking forward into the future. Here, what we're doing is we're trying to understand what processes gave rise or how can you explain uh, a historical set of data. So the red data is what actually happened in the model or in, in the real world, I should say. The blue data that we're seeing in this graph is showing what would happen if we didn't have this process of VTEC which is a volumetric excise tax credit, uh, a process in which refiners were going out and saying, I'm gonna use ethanol as a basis for providing octane value in gasoline, and then finally RINs so far. Does that help a little bit? All right, uh, just one more clarification. The red, uh, the red line data was still like uh, simulated right but what or was it simply like you just it's, added the information yeah it's it's simply input data. data from from history okay yeah so oh, that's right. that's data i took from history and just dumped in so we had a comparison so great question okay. okay so i'll do one more test here and then we'll we'll uh we'll go into a little bit of questions here in a few minutes so what happens if we reduce this volume extender and you remember remember kareem asked the question well how does that work? Well, the way that volume extender works here is basically a substitution. You can think of it at the point of distribution or almost at the pump where gasoline is pumped out um, in which I'm substituting up to a 10% blend ethanol for uh, gasoline because it's just cheaper to put the ethanol in there and I can save some money and, and, uh, at, 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 uh, in producing things. So that's that's the uh, last piece here. We'll run this. And you can see that consumption is much, much lower in this case, but you still see a fair amount of production. And part of the reason for that is you can see here, here's a set of exports. And we just see in run five here, you can see that exports are going through the roof here. So we're exporting a lot of ethanol in this case. And that's primarily because ethanol is pretty cheap relative to what you'd see on the export market. So there's some historical uh, sort of basis for that, uh, but this is a lot relative to what we'd otherwise see. The other thing you see here is that corn prices are a lot lower in this run than they would be in the model. So that's kind of interesting than historical. Okay, I'm going to do one more run here in which basically we flatten demand at its 2002 value. And that's what we do when we phase, when we uh, end the ethanol, we sort of don't impute any demand from, um, from the MTBE phase out. And if I run that, then I get a very different response. The industry never really takes off because there's not much demand there, kind of a flat demand. And what you see kind of in the agricultural system, I think is really interesting if I can make this refresh the screen correctly. There we go. So you can see now that uh, we're producing a whole lot less corn 
and you see a lot of corn land planted, a big gap between the historical record and what actually gets planted in this system. So there's some increased exports, but also um, what I don't show here, but what you'd see if you were to look at it would be that more land in the Corn Belt primarily has gone out of production with this. Okay, so some quick runs there to give you a sense for how you might use this model. And we spent seven minutes doing this. We spent a lot more time doing the analysis in the, uh, uh, for the paper. So take a look at the paper when you get a chance. Um, I'm going to go back over to here. And um, here we are. So, um, you know, I talked about quick simulations. We kind of went through that. That's good. Um, I want to shift gears and talk about practices now. And let's get this back here. So in terms of practices, this sort of uh, approach is, is the approach that I think I use when I'm building models, when I'm teaching and all of that stuff. So typically in terms of big picture stuff, I'm, I'm using sort of a design thinking mindset to approach this, which is to say that I'm asking kind of the question, how might we go about getting our heads around this problem by sharpening the focus, developing a simple map or a model, testing the thinking, doing a lot of iteration around that, and engaging in stakeholders. Um, so I think that that's an important piece. And I think in terms of the sort of the, the big picture skills involved, it's really important to be thinking dynamically, to be thinking operationally or physically about how processes work, to think expansively about the boundary of inquiry rather than more narrowly about things. Uh, to incorporate feedback, and then to have a really strong bias towards disconfirmation as opposed to uh, confirmation bias. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm distrustful of pretty much every result I see from the BSM, and I think that's a helpful mindset to have because that's a way to ensure that the thinking improves over time. So if you embed that thinking and mindset and skills in an iterative process, I think that gets you pretty far pretty fast. In terms of practices with the BSM, there's some things that worked really well for us that I, I would encourage you all to consider as you're working on your own activities. So the first is the idea of a modular design approach. What, what seems to be the case in BSM, and this is partly by design and partly because I think this is how the systems work, if you design modules correctly and well, you can have really rich feedback within modules and then relatively simple material and information handoffs uh, between those different modules. So let me try that one more time, I misspoke. So rich feedback within, but relatively simple stuff between modules. This gives you a mechanism for managing complexity, which in a, in a model like BSM is really, really paramount. Lots of dimensions uh, in arrays, lots of processes going on. So really, really important to, to think modularly. That's enabled us to do a lot of work really quickly that we probably wouldn't have otherwise been able to do if we kind of put everything into the model like Bleh. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is to develop and really lean on simple and reusable model structures. So in in BSM and in the little example that I showed you, we rely a lot on bass diffusion processes. And that's just a really, really simple two or three stock structure that moves stuff from the left to the right. And it, it makes it really, really easy to, uh, to make sense out of stuff. So we rely on that an awful lot. And we see that in a lot of different modules within, within BSM. We, we've developed an allocation structure that uses a mechanism called a logit function. And that's kind of geeky, but it's, it's a pretty good way to allocate resources among different needs or to allocate uh, land, to allocate scarce construction capacity and so forth. Um, so, so we rely on that an awful lot. We developed a pricing mechanism that's pretty generic 
And we use that in a lot of different places. And then finally, one of the wrinkles with all of this is that if you think about a conversion facility, it's it's like uh, it's like when when we had our kids. My wife was either pregnant or not. There wasn't much uh, sort of a continuous process there. And so what um, what we what we kind of needed to do in BSM was to create batch movement of facilities and track those. So we developed a structure for that. You can read the benefits faster than I can talk about them, but basically what that does is it reduces the cognitive load and it makes it easier for stakeholders to engage because they've seen something before and they can say, oh, this is like when you showed me X. It gives you some, some uh, traction there when working with stakeholders. In terms of the modeling process, we've used uh, what I'm calling agile-ish sprints. There's a whole discipline in the software world that Kareem could speak to, I'm sure, uh, called agile development. And one of the things that's really powerful about that is the idea of rapidly prototyping and rapidly getting feedback on a piece of work that you've done. Here, what we did in BSM was to very rapidly prototype pieces, get feedback, and strive towards what's called a minimum viable product that has the essence of the dynamics, in this case, that we're trying to represent. This uh, kept us very nicely in control. It's a really nice way to build models. So um, there's other aspects of it, you know, like reusable code and so forth, but uh, really important to do. We, we work in small teams, and I'm not sure if, uh, if that's how you all work in your work, but to have a small team in which you've got a modeler and a QA person working together, that's really good because then it's, it's, it's too easy for someone to convince themselves, you know, if I'm building a model that I've got it right, but if I can hand it to somebody who's going to test that stuff for me and give me feedback, that really improves the quality of the product. Um, and then finally, we've embraced version control. And we use, um, we use uh, GitHub as a mechanism for version control. I can't tell you how many times we found an issue. And we I've been able to trace that issue to a specific point in time when Either uh, somebody maybe typed a 12 when they should have been typing 42, or maybe they put a plus sign in an equation when they should have been putting a minus sign, those sort of things. Um, it really gives a wonderful mechanism for tracking things. And if you're not using version control for your models, you ought to be doing it. You, you just ought to be doing it. And GitHub is a pretty good approach. It's not too bad. And I'm going to actually end before we discuss with a little comic here. This is a comic from a, a group called XKCD. It's about GitHub. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very nice. It says, this is Git. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. And then the question is, cool, how do we use it? Well, uh, no idea. You just memorize these shell commands. And if you get errors, you uh, delete your project and download a fresh copy. That's kind of old school stuff. It actually this didn't didn't go over as a joke very well. I'm going to have to workshop this a little bit, I think, Allison. But um, what what would be good is to use GitHub. They have very nice uh, 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 applications that you can use, and uh, even you know non non geeks like me use it uh, continuously. And it's it's just really a powerful way to manage version control. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to open it up for questions and discussions. Yeah, so Steve, um, so you talked about modularization and things like that, but, you know, like when you build a big model, you know, debugging is always an issue. So two questions related to that. So when do you know the the model is big enough and what what are some good practices for debugging yeah so so i'm gonna try to that's that's like a a week-long conversation right ruby but um i tend to think modularly even with small models 
So I, when I'm building a model, um, a lot of folks will build models by saying, let me start with a causal loop diagram and then I'm going to model that causal loop diagram, right? That's a pretty common sort of approach to thinking about building models. Typically, I do things in a little bit different approach and I'll say, okay, what's accumulating here? What's flowing here? Or what's, what's the main process here? And then I'm going to ask, once I've sort of identified a process, I'm going to ask, what are the connecting points to other processes? And uh, if I can define a module as something where there's a lot of richness within it, but a couple of connecting points to other places, then that makes it very straightforward in terms of defining the module. And I can actually use those testing, uh, those connecting points as external inputs uh, when I'm when I'm doing my testing of the module. So let me let me try to give you an example here. And I'm going to uh, close this. And I'm going to do what am I going to do here? I'm going to do this. Give me just one second here. Here's a model. Good. OK, so. Here's a version of the um, of the simplified model. And what you see is a starch to ethanol module and a feedstock market module, right? So if you ask what's going on in this starch to ethanol versus feedstock, well, it's a pretty simple handoff. What's happening is starch to ethanol, the conversion process, wants to uh, know how much feedstock it's getting from the feedstock market. It wants to know what price that is. So there's like two inputs coming in from feedstock market. On the other hand, um, what, what the feedstock market needs to know is how much the starch to ethanol module is asking for. So we've got some relatively simple feedbacks. And what you could do is you could develop this module in isolation and then just use some simple inputs that are time series to, uh, to test and make sure that the module's making sense. So that's kind of what I do. The other thing that I'll do, and we can see this if we look inside, this is, this is kind of a view of the model and it's kind of messy, but you can see that within the model, I've used sectors, and those sectors are just boxes around different model structures, right? You'll also see the use of different colors within this. So you'll see a lot of red pieces here. Those red pieces represent data inputs to the model. And I've used color coding as a way to help me to manage the complexity and kind of keep things in track from a, and it's kind of a, a, a drill down into the modular end of things. Does that help a little bit, Ruby? Yeah, I think it helps a little bit. So, so you're talking about the reusable structure. So that's the sector that you kind of copy and paste, right? In different yeah, modules. this, this sector is reusable in different modules. And so, you know, what, what's been kind of cool is if I go and we can do this, I've left the starch to ethanol module and I go into the cellulose to ethanol module and you can see that it looks an awful lot the same, right? And the reason that it looks the same is that although its array structure is different, the feedstocks it takes are different, but it's it's very much the same in terms of the overall process of investing in conversion facilities, tracking uh, costs and yields and so forth. So that's that's kind of the the basic of the idea of the of the reusable structure makes it relatively easy to add, subtract, and so forth modules. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I still have more questions, but I like other people to ask their okay. questions as well. I think Kareem has a question. Yeah, as long as you're talking about you know how you develop a model, I would like to quote my good friend Steve Peterson, who says, "Never stray very far from a running model." So. That doesn't mean just running, but that you've tested it. So you're building it up as he was talking about, but you're testing it carefully at each stage and making sure that it's working. Yeah, in, in developing the BSM, we actually 
we we started with what's probably the hardest thing to manage, which is the United States agricultural system. And we we worked with that, you know, really, really simply and then built that out over time. And then we we tested that and we presented that to folks from USDA as well as a bunch of agricultural economists and uh, and and some folks at, at DOE. That was a really helpful exercise. Okay, other other comments, other questions? Uh, Stephen, I also had a question. I was wondering uh, what factors uh, you use to uh, forecast or to define the land allocation in your study? Yeah, so what we do is, um, his, so, so the USDA, so I'm, I'm gonna back up just a little bit here. USDA has more data than you can imagine. I mean, they're really good at collecting data about the agricultural system. And so within each of the regions that we represent in the model, um, we, we know how much land was planted in corn, wheat, soy, and so forth. Um, we know how much was harvested. We know what the yields were. So, so all of that data is there. That provides a basis for calibrating the model. And what we do in the model is we have a, uh, an allocation mechanism that uh, we use then to calibrate overall production. And I've sort of rolled that up over the, over the United States, but we use that to, to calibrate the model against history. That was, a, um, you know, there's some tools within Stella and within other software packages that enable you to do this calibration automatically. And that was pretty helpful to us. So, so data from USDA, we have uh, a an allocation mechanism uh, which is uses a, a logit choice sort of formulation to do that, and then that allocation method uh, is calibrated to match the data that we have. Does that does that help a little bit? Okay, so allocation mechanism is already defined there by the yeah. authorities or whoever, okay. No, and so what the allocation tool method, is that? There's, there's lots of different allocation mechanisms, but the allocation mechanism that we use is, uh, is a logit choice mechanism. And I can kind uh -huh. of show you the structure. Well, actually the structure is gonna be take, take too much time to do, so I'm not gonna show that to you. But basically the idea is if you think about uh, a, a hectare of land, that land could be planted in some mix of crops and the mix, the proportion of, of hectares that are in corn versus soy versus wheat versus other grains versus cotton is driven by the relative profitability of those different crops in those different uses, which in turn is driven by the price of those crops which we generate uh, endogenously uh, and, uh, and by the yield of those crops. So that's, that's, that's the sort of the mechanism. Uh, what we do is we tune the calibration of that to uh, make it either slower or faster in response to changes in, um, in the relative profitability. All right, and you just mentioned something in Stella that helps doing um, calibration you said or something because I'm also using Stella so I just wanted to ask what exactly you were talking in Stella. Yeah, that so, so there's a there's a panel here which is called model analysis tools and uh, this is sort of a build off of sensitivity analysis and Kareem who actually worked on this uh, would be able to describe it better. But basically the idea would be you could describe a payoff metric. And then uh, in the case of land allocation, you could create sort of a minimum squared errors metric that asks within a region, how do I minimize the error uh, between what's historically been seen and what uh, the model is generating cumulatively over the course of the simulation that you're doing. 
Um, and then you could compare that, uh, or, or then you could set a set of parameters. And in our case, it would be this attractiveness weighting factor, how responsive I am to, um, to those different, um, to different profitabilities uh, of, of the relative crops. And if I do that, then I can uh, basically set this to minimize that, that payoff metric over time, that will give me a value for the variable in the model that optimizes in the sense of trying to track history in a pretty good way. Does that, does that help a little bit? There's a lot of words there, and I'm not sure if that resonated very well. But uh, the basic yeah, idea, I've, I've explored this option before, so uh, now I know. Like, um, yeah. Um, yeah. I got and, it. And there's some, some pretty common optimization methods. Uh, so Powell is, is a pretty common thing. There's a grid method that is pretty time consuming. And then there's a differential evolution method, but I think you'd have to read Kareem's uh, PhD thesis to uh, understand that. Is that right, Kareem? No, not really. So, not really. Um, but the, the grid method is really just a testing method. I, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, it's not really a method. It's just a, a exhaustive search method. Um, it's not really a typical optimization method. The uh, other two are. Um, we have three free webinars Rakshinda that discuss calibration optimization. We have, I think, three also blog posts that talk about it. Um, and we're working on uh, a free webinar that's going to bring up uh, introduction to optimization. Calibration is a subset of optimization. Thank you. All right, so I know we over time. Um, but yeah, looks like the conversation can still go on forever. So Steve, probably we can invite you back another day and then we can continue the discussion. Well, and if that makes sense, that's great. If not, that's OK, too. So. Yeah, so we just really appreciate you for putting the presentation together and provided some um, interesting jokes about Idaho and <laughs> your career. Um, yeah, so again, thank you so much for your time and thanks everybody for joining the uh, November meeting of our uh, environmental SIG. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. All right. Good thanks, you. folks. We'll see you all later. Great to see you. Bye now. Bye bye.